cardiac arrest survivors in particular, um, and anyone who's had kind of like a traumatic cardiovascular event, you're going to be more prone to actually have mental health issues. So if you look at the studies, they're saying that like 30% and more patients who've had some type of traumatic cardiovascular event, they're more likely to have anxiety, depression, and PTSD. But no one ever really talks about that. Um, yeah. And especially when you come see a heart doctor, you're only seeing us for 15 to 30 minutes. And we're focusing on the heart rate, on your blood pressure. Sometimes I just take a step back and I'm like, you know, what? how have you been? Like, you look different or you look like you're not sleeping or you look yeah. like you're more stressed. Like, what's going on with you? And you'd be surprised what patients, you know, tell you when you allow them to open up like that. What's up there, everyone? Welcome to another episode here on the podcast of the Heart Warrior Project. I'm Yelis Fass, I'm the founder of the Heart Warrior Project, your host, and as well a fellow sudden cardiac arrest survivor. Now, in this episode, I had the pleasure to talk with board certified cardiologist Dr. George Adeshino. And um, I drew a whole bunch of questions that you send in at him here in this episode. Now, to everyone who's sending uh, a question, uh, thank you. I did my best to uh, throw most of the questions at uh, Dr. Adeshino. Uh, now, I couldn't add, uh, throw all of them at, at him. Uh, you know, he, he, he was actually in a hospital working, so I couldn't have him for three hours on the podcast. But I did throw uh, quite a fair share of questions at him that you send in. Um, but I also want to thank you for sending in your questions. As besides, of course, that I hope that these episodes can improve the quality of your life. I also really enjoy doing these episodes and talking with uh, cardiac health experts. And by sending in questions to me, you make it possible for these episodes to uh, to happen. Now, if you want to send in your questions to the next cardiac health experts and you want to be a part of this episodes then be sure to subscribe to the newsletter as that's where i will make an announcement and where you can read about who the next cardiac health expert is and where you can send uh, in your questions in the description you can find a link to subscribe to the newsletter uh, now of course you can also just subscribe to the podcast here as i will also bring out an announcement uh, episode here on the podcast but if you also want to stay up to date about any events then the newsletter is definitely a good place uh, yeah, to subscribe to. Now, having said that, I hope that you will find this episode with Dr. George Adesino helpful and that you will learn uh, a thing or two from this episode that can improve your life. Uh, I honestly learned quite a lot uh, from this episode myself and I honestly had a really good time chatting with Dr. Adesino. He... He, I mean, just from the hour that I chatted with him, seems like such an amazing person and such an amazing doctor. And I think you as well will feel it in the episode. Um, yeah, he really cares about this, about the work that he does and about his patients. And you can really feel that. Now, to find any of the resources mentioned in this episode by Dr. Adeshino, uh, such as ways to connect with him, uh, then check out the show notes, which are located in the description of this episode. Or you can also go directly to heartwarriorproject.com slash podcast and search for George and the episode, the show notes will pop up. With that, please enjoy this episode with board certified cardiologist, Dr. George Adeshino. Dr. George Adeshino, a warm welcome here to the podcast of the Heart Warrior Project. I am really excited to have you here on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me, man. Yeah, definitely. I'm, I'm glad we were able to do this for sure. Anything you got, definitely throw it at me. Hopefully this is a good combo. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, I like I said also before we start recording, I've gathered a bunch of questions from listeners and I'm going to throw them at you. Uh, but I thought just before I'm going to do that, I was actually really curious to hear, you know, what made you decide to become a cardiologist? Because it's not a path. I mean, it's a long path, right? So, yeah. How, what got you interested to take that path? Yeah, it, it, it's, it's definitely a long path. It's uh, four years of college, um, four years of med school, three years of residency, and three years of fellowship. So, it, it definitely adds up um, for sure. Um, I think for me, you know, I've kind of always known that I wanted to be a doctor. Um, 
you know, I love science and I love studying people and being around people and observing different people's, you know, cultures and habitats. And so I felt like medicine was always like the perfect marriage between those two interests. And then personally, you know, I started having some heart issues myself in elementary school. So I've had really? palpitations since like the age of 10. I mean, severe enough where like I was close to passing out. Um, and because my parents knew, you know, I, I wanted to play sports, I wanted to be active. They were pretty vigilant about getting me checked out fairly early. And I remember going to the cardiologist office. I was probably like, I want to say 10, 11, 12, somewhere in that range. And I was just so engrossed in every, like I was asking so many questions. I wanted to know what the waveforms, like what is this EKG? What is this ultrasound? Tell me everything. And I was just so into it. I think from that point on, I knew I had to do cardiology and everything that I've done since then has kind of just gotten me to that path. Wow. Okay. I mean, in a way I liked, well, I don't like that, but that you also, you have some heart problems. So you know what it can be like to be a patient and to be at the cardiologist as a patient, right? Um, Cause I don't know if there's a lot of cardiologists who also have heart issues, but I guess most don't, which is good again. Uh, how is your heart today actually? So it's good. I mean, I think like any cardiovascular condition, it goes up and down. I was yeah. very lucky. Um, so I have frequent PVCs and PACs, which are kind of just like extra heartbeats where the top chambers of my heart sometimes throw an extra heartbeat out. And then sometimes the bottom chambers of my heart sometimes throw an extra heartbeat out as well. The overall count that I have is nothing too concerning, but I can definitely feel it a little bit more. So if I'm exercising, like, you know, I'm a long distance runner. So if I run too long, I can definitely feel it. Increased stress, caffeine, um, decreased sleep, those tend to affect me more. And then, of course, you know, I'm a father of two. So with two kids, you know, running around with them as well, too, I wow. can feel it. But yeah. Um, yeah, but luckily, you know, I haven't had any issues with it. Good. It is something that I have to um, watch out for. But you made a really good point. I do think it, it kind of gives me an advantage in regards to my bedside manner. Because I do know how it feels to be on the other side. And yeah. a lot of the tests that I'm prescribing to my patients, I've done that before. So I can tell them like, hey, yeah, I've done a treadmill. Yeah. This is what the treadmill feels like. I've done an ultrasound. They're going to put pressure in your chest. It sometimes can hurt or the gel is going to be cold. That's what that feels like. And so I do think it allows me to kind of sympathize and empathize with them. But then also making sure that I'm explaining things in a manner that I can have them understand, but also make them feel comfortable so I feel like that's something I've always carried with me. And I think that's a huge advantage um, when it comes to my bedside manner and just relating to my patients on like a one-on-one -on -one basis. Yeah, totally. And what are you specialized in as a cardiologist or what is like your main focus that you see patients uh, for? So I'm a general cardiologist, so I see a little bit of everything, um, but I'm really into imaging. And so I do a lot of the advanced imaging um, in our practice as well. And so that's kind of been the biggest scope. Um, for my what personal is passion, advanced though, really, imaging. Say that one more time. Advanced imaging. What do you mean? So uh, n not only are we doing just like EKGs and echocardiograms and stuff like that, we're also starting to do CAT scans of people's hearts as well. And so we're able to look at your arteries just with the CAT scan, and uh, and it allows us to figure out if you have any early signs of like heart blockages, heart damage, and things of that nature. Um, and so, but my biggest thing, though, I'm really big on prevention. I think a lot of the times we as cardiologists, you know, people feel like we just throw out medications or just want to treat things or send you for a procedure. But I'm really big on like, let's get down to the foundation of what yeah. is causing your issue and what are the things that we can change with your lifestyle before we proceed forward with medications. So that's something that I'm really big on, um, something that I'm really trying to inspire other people to be advocates for themselves about as well. I think or I would assume that a lot of patients would actually appreciate that greatly, right? That you're more caring about prevention instead of just, yeah, treating uh, the, the condition. Oh, 100%. And a lot of the times too, you know, I've had patients come to me and they have like high blood pressure, high cholesterol or like palpitations. And, you know, people have thrown medication at them, but they really haven't taken a step back to figure yeah. out, like, like what's the overall underlying unifying factor? And so I, that's the one thing that I do. You know, like I saw a patient the other day. She's been on, like, three different blood pressure and heart rate controlling medications. No one ever asked her how much caffeine she was drinking per day. She was drinking three pots of coffee every single day. Oof. And I just told her to get off of that first and let's <laughs> see everything got better on its own. 
So just yeah. kind of getting to the foundation of things, I'm really big on that, especially in our younger patients. Yeah. The last thing I want to do is put a 20-something-year-old patient on medication for the rest of their lives. So if there's anything that we can do from a lifestyle standpoint, I zero in on that 100%. Yeah, that's amazing. That's amazing to hear, actually. Okay. All right. So um, I'm going to throw some questions at you from uh, listeners. And uh, like I also said before we recorded, I'm going to paste them here in the chats. I'm also going to read them out loud, uh, you know, for people uh, listening. Uh, I'm probably going to butcher some names. <laughs> so <laughs> if... Uh, yeah, if I do that, then uh, my apolog uh, apologies, don't take it personal. Uh, so we got a first question from Rachel, yeah, Kubi, Quebec. Um, mm -hmm. I have lots of questions about the long-term effects of beta blockers. For example, is there any correlation between being on a beta blocker like Metaprolol for lifetime and getting dementia? Uh, my grandmother was on a beta blocker for decades, and my mom is 100% convinced her eventual dementia, 50 years of hell, uh, was due to the drug. Uh, obviously, dementia is correlated with high blood pressure, which is why she was on a beta blocker to begin with. I guess I'm just wondering if there are any studies out there that definitely uh, solve this chicken-egg conundrum. And I think it's hard. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. Uh, I also generalized the question a little bit, so I added a little generalization to it. What are the long-term effects of beta blockers, knowing that most you know, sudden cardiac arrest survivors have to be on them their whole life? I think it's hard because I don't know if there's a lot of studies in regards to looking, you know, following patients from a very young age to a late age. Um, yeah. The biggest kind of side effect of beta blockers, though, of course, it decreases your heart rate, and so anything that might um, uh, surround that. So fatigue, um, some people can pass out if their heart rates get too low, feeling dizzy, things of that nature. I think it is hard because she hit the nail on the head. If you have high blood pressure, you're at a higher risk to have vascular dementia, which is the clogging of the arteries of the brain. And so I think there's going to be too many confounding factors for you to tease out whether the beta blocker causes a dementia, but I think it's less likely, most likely. And are there any long-term effects of beta blockers, you know, to take them your whole life, like negative effects, of course, that we know of? I mean, not really, but honestly, with any medication, there's always going to be some type of risk. And for us as physicians, and especially when we're explaining it to patients, we always have to figure out what are the long-term effects and risk versus the benefit. Yeah. And specifically someone with sudden cardiac arrest, the benefits are always going to outweigh the risk. And so even if we find something that might happen long, long down the road, the fact that we might be saving your life and decreasing your mentality is always going to outweigh any other risk. And so I think you really have to kind of keep that in mind, whether you're looking at medications, any type of treatment, any type of test, what is that risk to benefit ratio and let that kind of guide your decision. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, I'm actually going to throw a question at you that I wrote. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh -oh. Yeah, but I'm just going to paste it here for you to also just read it, but uh, I, I don't have to read it per se. But this is something that I'm actually, you know, having had a cardiac arrest and having had a heart disease my whole life. Uh, I'm just, and I I hate in a way making the comparison because it sounds that I don't care about cancer, which I do, you know, it's a horrible disease. But... Mm -hmm. You know, heart disease is the number one killer for both men and women. And correct me if I'm wrong, right? I just feel... No, that's right. Yeah, Wor worldwide. That's important to say worldwide yeah. as well. Yeah, I just feel that there's so little awareness around heart disease. There are so little campaigns compared to cancer. And the same with cardiac arrest. If I tell people that I had a cardiac arrest, most people think I had a heart attack. Like, they don't know the difference like i told this to someone recently and she was like oh did you call the ambulance i was like well, well no i was well i was dead on the floor so i couldn't do much <laughs> yeah um we can't really and, do that yeah and i just wanted to hear your opinion on this is is this maybe just in belgium or is this a, a thing in the us too uh or is there a reason that you think of why there might be or might why it might seem that there's less awareness around heart disease and cardiac arrest compared to cancer? 
I think with cancer, it just sounds so much more scary. And a lot of the yeah. times it happens to people who are a lot, you know, it happens earlier in life as well. And so mm -hmm. I think people will kind of gravitate towards those important factors. One thing that we started noticing is that, you know, the awareness for heart disease in men in the United States is pretty high. So everyone kind of knows that that's something that men were suffering for. But for women, there's still been this lag of education is that, you know, it's like you said, it's the number one killer for both men and women. But if you talk to a lot of women, they're actually more worried or they're kind of conditioned to worry more about breast cancer compared yeah. to heart disease. And yeah. so we're still trying to work on that lag to kind of move everybody up to, to this century to know like, hey, this is affecting everybody equally. And so yeah. knowing the sign, knowing the symptoms, knowing when you should get checked, we're still not doing that great of a job when it comes to that. And I think particularly with women, a lot of the literature and a lot of the scientific studies that we use, if you look at the participants, most of them are men. And so there's a lot of information that we just don't have about women. So there really hasn't been a focus. And so I think the United States, we're doing a little bit more. But I agree with you. I think worldwide, we're not we're not talking about that nowhere near enough. And now that we have so many medical advances where people are going to be living a lot longer, we're going to be seeing heart disease more. We're more sedentary. We're eating, you know, probably the worst than we ever have in human history. And so this is going to be something that we're going to continue to see the numbers increase unless we do something about it. And so we have to start off with education with our children in school. You know, our young adults, everyone needs to be educated on this for sure. Yeah. And I guess, like you said, um, I mean, if you would make a movie about a cancer patient and someone who had a cardiac arrest, it's more horrific the story, the, like that movie with a cancer patient, like that process, mm -hmm. right? Than someone who has a cardiac arrest, because the movie would just end. <laughs> and I mean, okay, mm -hmm. unless they survived, right? Um, well, yeah, I was gonna say we got. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I will say this though. Um... I don't know if you if you saw, you know, we had an American football player recently that had a cardiac arrest um, during during a football game. And um, that woke a lot of people up. And so my DMs were flooded with questions because, like you said, people had never heard about this before. And they're just like, how is this young, healthy guy in mm -hmm. the peak of his career, in the peak of his performance? How is he, you know, dying on the field? And so, yeah. Like you said, it's unfortunate that happened to him, but I do think that that opened up a lot of eyes and it's allowing us to have conversations like this. So kudos to you, first of all, for doing this because this you're you're helping us combat this. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And, and especially because I am a younger person, I also try to have some younger people on the podcast because just to show uh, that there are young people where this happens to as well. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Cardiac arrest can happen to anyone, uh, sadly enough, just mm -hmm. like cancer, of course. Um, but okay. All right. Uh, let me throw another question at you. Uh, and this is actually, uh, maybe a little bit of a controversial topic, but a lot of people were very curious about this. So I am just gonna ask it. And this is around COVID and sudden cardiac arrest. I I'm pretty sure you had a lot of questions at, around that too. So let me read it. Um, I'll, this is from Donna K. Uh, I'd like to know what his thoughts would be on young, active, 56-year-old with no present medical issues. Could be fine one moment <laughs> out shopping and the next second be dropped dead on the floor suffering a cardiac arrest. Uh, no reason they could find the, that caused it. Only thing was I did have COVID two weeks prior to having my sudden cardiac arrest. Just wondering what his thoughts are on COVID causing some of these sudden cardiac arrests. In so many young folks, we see this uh, happening too. And let me just then add a little bit what I made, you know, from it. Uh, are there any studies being done to find out a possible correlation between recent sudden cardiac arrests and COVID-19 infection or the vaccine as a trigger? Definitely. So the, the issue is, you know, COVID is a game changer. <laughs> Um, I, that was probably the most stressful time period I've ever had in my career, um, yeah. during the pandemic. And it was because everything was so new and there were so mm. many changes. Literally we would hear something Monday and then by Friday we were told something different. And so for us, you know, we work off of science, we work off of literature. What's the evidence? What, 
what are the studies showing that's going to help my patient benefit or sure. what treatment I need to give the patient? And we didn't have that. So we were mm -hmm. really kind of treating and diagnosing on the seat of our pants because, again, we had nothing. I always tell people we have to think about it. It seems like that was another lifetime ago. But if you really look, it's only been three years. And so we yeah. still don't have a lot of long term scientific evidence of how COVID is affecting all of our hearts. What we do know is there was a correlation between um, having myocarditis, which is inflammation of the heart muscle after having um, COVID-19. Well, um, okay. Some people got it with the actual infection. Some people got it with the vaccine. But if you looked at the numbers, it was a, a overwhelming amount more risk of having myocarditis with the actual virus compared to the vaccine. We saw it mainly in healthy young men, so athletes. So we really weren't seeing it in, you know, otherwise healthy females like I think um, um, this person's question was like a 56 year old female. We were, really weren't seeing that population. The major people we were seeing it in were these young, healthy um, males. It's also important to note is that even though cardiac arrest it wasn't really that um, well known amongst people, it happened before COVID, you know, yeah, yeah. all over the world every single year. And it's happening after COVID. And so yeah. I think the tendency is to link those two things because, again, we're in uncharted territory. But if you look at the evidence, there isn't a strong um, link to it. It's always a possibility, again, because we just don't know. But I don't think there's a strong link. Okay. Yeah. And it can be also a bit of a confirmation bias, right, that you – like you said, co uh, cardiac arrest happened before uh, COVID as well, right? Uh, but the confirmation mm -hmm. bias is basically that you seek information that confirms – what you believe right uh, 100%. Not, not, yeah and it, it's a good question right because i'm sure that you had a lot a lot of questions around this in uh, at the hospital too right uh because people yeah uh, definitely worry about this yeah there were and my, my biggest thing is i always tell people like i don't want them to feel like i'm shutting them down but mm -hmm. i do think it's important that i want to make sure that we're, we're redirecting misinformation because you can kind of fall down a rabbit hole and mm -hmm. only focus on things that are adhering to your personal beliefs where it's really important that we keep a broad kind of spectrum of knowledge to make sure we're really hearing both sides of everything mm -hmm. and so you know i will tell you i'm probably one of the biggest <laughs> um conspiracy theorists out there but I'm a physician, so I have to look at the science. And so it's really important, yeah. despite how we feel or, you know, we're worried about things, we're scared about things, we're uncertain about things. I always say, look at the science and look at the numbers because the numbers don't lie. Hey, my apologies for interrupting the conversation. It will just take a moment. If you like the conversation so far and would like to support the Heart Warrior Project, check out the truly awesome looking t-shirts and mugs I created together with an illustrator for fellow Heart Warriors. My goal in creating the t-shirts and mugs was to create something that would help me feel more empowered in the battle that surviving this cardiac arrest has been and, well, still is in many ways to show not only the world, but also myself, the heart warrior that, that I have become. And by offering the t-shirts and mugs on the Heart Warrior Project, I too hope that it can help fellow cardiac arrest survivors feel empowered too. The mug has become my go-to mug. I, I drink my coffee from it every morning and my tea throughout the day. Also, the t-shirts I personally love so much that I ordered more than a couple of them myself. I frequently wear one throughout the day and uh, certainly you can see me wear the t-shirt when I'm out climbing. I can only say this, have a look at the t-shirt designs and the mugs. And if you like what you see, I tell you, you won't regret ordering either the t-shirt, the mug or both of them. Not only will you have a fitting mug and or t-shirt for your current lifestyle, but you'll also be supporting the Heart Warrior Project and help me to continue doing this. In the description of this episode, you can find a link that will take you to the page where you can order both the t-shirt and the mug, or you can also go directly to heartwarriorproject.com to find it. All right, thanks for taking a moment to listen. Now let's return to the conversation. Uh, I actually had another question that kind of follows uh, this question a bit, but I think you you did uh, kind of talk about it, uh, but I'm just going to paste it. So uh, it's from Tracy N, and it's a bit like, well, what you said. I, I just, I really want to hear more doctors speak about the link of COVID to myocarditis to heart failure. Uh, 
is there actually a link between the two? Yeah, there there is a, a, a decrease or there is a, a, a increase, a small increase. But again, it's mainly in younger males, um, and it's after more so having the virus and the vaccine. I think a lot of people, when that study came out, they were very worried about not wanting to get the vaccine because of that worry. But again, if you look at the risk versus the benefit, again, mm. the the benefit of you getting the COVID vaccine and protecting yourself against the COVID virus mm. is going to far outweigh the risk. And so it's really important to note that. And if you really just look at the overall um, relationship between COVID and the heart, you know, there's a lot of different manifestations and complications you can have after having the, the, the virus. Uh, sometimes you can also see that after getting the vaccine. But again, the numbers show that it's more the virus, the actual infection that's uh, causing these cardiovascular manifestations more than getting the vaccine. So it's really important to note that as well. Um, do do they know or, you know, do they know why males, why it's more common for males than females? Is there a reason for that? We don't know. And sometimes, too, it's hard because, you know, you diagnose myocarditis um, with the cardiac MRI. And we were only really doing that after these patients persisted. So they could have had some type of genetic link that made them more predisposed. They could have had some type of underlying structural issue as well. So there's a lot of confounding factors with that. Um, I think because we do know it's more so that actual population, we can focus a little bit more on them. Mm. Um, but again, just looking at that risk to benefit ratio is going to be really important. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, let's see. We got uh, all right here. Another question from Dof Dof Men. Um, if you think I, I say a name wrong, you can always correct me too. <laughs> I was going to say, pop that up again. How did you spell it? The, you, you see the name? I don't Dolph? see it anymore. It fell down. Oh, uh, let me. I'll uh, just. Here. Oh, here we go. Oh, Doug. Doc, man. Oh, okay. Yep, Doc. <laughs> so, question from Doc. <laughs> I am wondering what the focus should be on blood panels. My doctor talks about LDL. Uh, numbers, but I read a lot of line about ApoB levels. Thanks. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe if you could also explain what LDL is, uh, just you know, for everyone to know, and what ApoB levels are. Uh, I don't know what that is actually. ApoB levels. I do know LDL, but um, yeah, yeah. So LDL is a type of cholesterol that's in your body. So it's low density lipoprotein, and yep. HDL is high density lipoprotein. And so I kind of tell patients, LDL is the bad cholesterol, right? So this is the, the cholesterol that's going to be out circulating in the bloodstream, in the arteries that can attach to your arteries and cause blockages that can uh -huh. lead to a heart attack. Okay. HDL is what's going to help clear out those blockages. So it's taking cholesterol from the bloodstream and bringing it to the liver. So I kind of think like LDL is bad because it's giving you the fat and HDL is good because it's taking the fat to the liver. So it's essentially, the lower your LDL, the lower your bad cholesterol, the less likely you are to form those plaques and deposits. And the higher the HDL, again, the same thing, the lower chances you have of building those plaques. But if the LDL is high, you're going to be at a super high chance of having that, uh, those depositions, which can lead to a heart attack. And so traditionally, we would look at these numbers and just treat depending on what the number is. But recently, we've been doing this thing called a 10-year ASCVD. It's a calculation that tells us in the next 10 years, what's the chances of you having a stroke or a, hardi a cardiac event? Anyone who has a 7.5% chance and above ideally should be on a cholesterol medication. If your score is below that, we can kind of work on lifestyle modification like diet and exercise and monitor you a little bit closely. There are higher risk patients, like patients who have diabetes or they've had a history of a stroke or a heart attack in the past. Those, those high risk populations should be on a cholesterol medication no matter what. Um, in regards to the apolipoprotein, that's actually a new cardiac um, biomarker that we're studying currently. And it's kind of letting us know, like, no matter what your cholesterol panel does, that might be an indication that you might be someone who is at a higher risk for a cardiovascular event. So that's actually something that's fairly new coming down the pipeline. Um, so I won't speak too much on it because I think we're still doing studies on it. We're actually enrolling um, patients to a study that here um, at my institution, where essentially we're going to be tracking apolipoprotein and kind of seeing like, are those patients more higher risk for cardiovascular disease and events? 
And are those the patients that we should be treating a little bit more aggressively, no matter what their cholesterol panel looks like? And so that's something that's kind of evolving. It hasn't really made its way fully into medical practice, but that's definitely coming down the pipeline. But I always tell patients, I think it's really important to make sure you're getting your cholesterol checked with your yearly physicals, just so you have an idea of kind of what's going on and things that you need to work on. Again, focusing on that lifestyle modification so that you don't get the point of needing the medication. Mm -hmm. And what should we focus our attention on, you know, um, around like blood, you know, panels, uh, or what can positively affect these blood panels? Uh, Or like, how can you lower your uh, cholesterol, for example? Can you say some things on that? Yeah. So there are some conditions that unfortunately, no matter what you do from a lifestyle standpoint, your cholesterol will be elevated. So there's like genetic Mm -hmm. mutations. The most, the one in particular that we get worried about is called familial hypercholesterolemia, meaning there's a genetic defect that's in the family that causes these patients to metabolize cholesterol differently. So they could eat probably cardboard and still have high cholesterol levels. But the vast uh, majority of patients, the, the vast majority of population, you can really control it well with diet and exercise. So getting some type of physical activity three to five times a week, we usually say to shoot for 75 minutes of high intensity exercise or 150 minutes of moderate exercise per week. No matter what you're doing, as long as you hit those time goals, that should be enough to keep those levels low. And then diet, I think, is probably the most important thing that, you know, I think a lot of people struggle with, especially, you know, we're in the this this realm where we're doing a lot of everything's fast. Right. So fast food we're ordering in. We're um, getting food to go a lot. And a lot of those pre-prepared meals and processed meals are just not good for our bodies long term. So trying to eat a healthy Mediterranean diet, so low in fat, um, low in processed carbs, um, high in protein, high in fiber, stick to that. That should serve you well. Mm. And what about like what about like coffee or does that not affect anything? Uh, I mean, it does raise your heart rate, of course, too. But is that something good to focus on? Or is that something good to lower a little bit? I say it depends on the patient. I think if you're doing it in moderation and you're not having symptoms from it, it should be fine. I will say this, though. I do see a lot of younger patients coming in with palpitations and tachycardia and high blood pressure. And the major thing is they're drinking a lot of coffee. They're drinking energy drinks. They're doing pre-workout supplements that have caffeine in them. Mm -hmm. And so in that standpoint, doing that for a long period of time can cause some prolonged damage to the heart from a long period of time. So I say as as long as you, if you're doing like, you know, eight to like maybe 12 ounces a day, I don't think that's really bad. Anything Mm -hmm. more than that, especially if you're having symptoms, then I would definitely cut back. Okay. And is there something more besides diet and exercise that we don't focus enough on that could also positively affect like your blood panels or just, uh, yeah, that that people should do more? Honestly, I think the biggest thing is probably stress. Um, And I'm really glad because I think, you know, I'm so I'm I'm going to be I'll be 40 in about. Yeah, my birthday's in a week. So I'll be 40 in about a week. And I feel like, yeah, you can tell I got the gray hair coming out here. But Uh, it looks um, all right. (laughs) (laughs) But I think my generation of physicians and those coming below us, we're starting to focus a lot more on your mental health. And I'm right. really glad that that is happening because that really affects your overall physical health. And mm-hmm. I think for a long time, people really thought those two things were completely separate when it's all on the same continuum. It's all on the same spectrum and cycle. So if you're not taking care of your mental health, that can affect your physical health. If you're not taking care of your physical health, that can you know, mess up your mental health. And so just from being stressed out, from not sleeping enough, from not you know, taking care of your mentation, that can actually cause inflammation in your body, which can increase your um, your blood counts. It can worsen yeah. your cholesterol. It can increase your blood sugar. So all of those things are connected. And I really feel like we as physicians, especially specialists, we're not doing as good of a job as we could be as focusing in on that. Um, and it's funny because I think cardiac arrest survivors in particular, um, and anyone who's had kind of like a traumatic cardiovascular event, you're going to be more prone to actually have mental health issues. So if you look at the studies, they're saying that like 30% and more patients who've had some type of traumatic cardiovascular event, they're more likely to have anxiety, depression, and PTSD. But no one ever really talks about that. Um, 
Yeah. And especially when you come see your heart doctor, you're only seeing us for 15 to 30 minutes. We're focusing on the heart rate, on your blood pressure. Sometimes I just take a step back and I'm like, you know, how have you been? Like, you look different or you look like you're not sleeping or you look yeah. like you're more stressed. Like, what's going on with you? And you'd be surprised what patients, you know, tell you when you allow them to open up like that. That's amazing that you do that because you're so right. <laughs> I mean, the mental health sides of having survived the cardiac arrest, I definitely... Uh... I felt the impact on my own mental health from that. And, for, you know, from other survivors that I talked to here on the podcast, yeah, many struggle with an anxiety, depression, or PTSD. Uh, and uh, a bit like me with many other, patient, oh, other cardiac arrest survivors, once you are out of the hospital, or at least it was for me, it's a bit you're on your own now. Um, and I do have an amazing cardiologist, by the way, because he also noticed last time, that I was mentally just struggling a bit and he did provide uh, some mental health support. So it's great that there's more focus on this too, because it's a huge factor. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. And you know what, too, I would also kind of extend that to the loved ones of the survivors as well. Mm. Um, recently, actually this, this happened this week, which was, you know, I was, I was telling my wife, I was like, I think this is divine timing that I was supposed to come on your podcast this week. Yeah, okay. Cause I felt like I just saw multiple patients who had cardiac arrest and I'm just like, oh. what is the universe trying to tell me? But, um, one, one in particular that really stood out to me, um, was I had this one young lady who, uh, she had a cardiac event in her sleep. Her husband was trying to wake her up and noticed she wasn't breathing and he had to do CPR on her. And, you know, the kids heard the commotion. So our young kids came in. They saw their mom lifeless. Um, They saw, you know, EMS, you know, defibrillating her. And so, like, the kids have anxiety now as well. Her husband has PTSD. Her husband has not slept since her uh, her cardiac arrest because he wants to stand over her and literally watch her sleep. So he is like, it's completely rocked the whole entire household. And so I think it's important for us to recognize this in our yeah. cardiac arrest survivors, but also extend that grace to those who are with them as well, too, because it, it affects oh, yeah. the whole family. You're 100% correct. Yes. Crazy. Yeah. I actually had my cardiac arrest, too, when I was asleep. <laughs> uh, and it was just when I started dating my girlfriend. So it was like one of the first nights that I was like staying over. <laughs> and then I... Uh, oh, wow. no way. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> that was a wild night uh, for, yeah, for her. Um, yeah. Okay. Mm. Uh, let me go uh, ahead and actually throw another question at you. So this might be a bit of a, I don't know, maybe a frustrating question in, in, in to answer at least. Uh, so this is from Jane Carr. I would like to find out why a person, me with no history of heart disease, never had high cholesterol or uh, high blood pressure, petite build weighing, uh, 180 at 5.1 can have a silent STEMI. I don't know what that is. Uh, that threw me into VFIP, sinus tachycardia, short QT, and sudden cardiac arrests. And then I uh, kind of extended uh, the question with just, um, you know, why does it sometimes still seem to be a mystery why some people have a cardiac arrest? And again, I guess this might be a bit of a frustrating question, but just throwing it at you. Um, so for her, she kind of, uh, she, she talked about an acronym STEMI, which is ST elevation myocardial infarction, which is just uh-huh. a fancy name for a heart attack that we see in signs and symptoms on an EKG. Oh, um, okay. in her, in her actual, it's hard because, you know, I don't have her complete medical history, so I can't really tell her exactly what was going on. I will say though, in most cases where it's not like a uh, trauma or, you know, patients like hemorrhaging and bleeding to death. In most cardiac arrest cases, 90% of those patients will have some type of structural abnormality, whether mm-hmm. it's something that they, they've they had since birth or something mm-hmm. that may have happened later on. But most patients have some type of structural abnormality. Yeah. And so there is a complete workup that we like to do to make sure we're not missing anything. Most of it involves, one, making sure there's no heart blockages, making sure there's no um, coronary anomalies. So sometimes... The arteries that feed your heart sometimes don't develop correctly um, in utero. And so sometimes that can increase the chances of patients having cardiovascular events. Um, You can have bobular issues that can predispose you. 
thickness of the heart. Like um, I saw, I, I, first of all, I love the podcast you had with the two sisters with hypertrophic cardio. That oh, was yeah. such a great episode. Um, <laughs> yeah. But that's a really common one that we see also in young athletes as well. Um, if it's not a structural thing, we can sometimes see an electrical abnormality. Again, most of the time people were born with this as well too. But there are a subset of patients that we do not find the reason. And so it's what we call idiopathic, where we don't, we've gone through the cascade of guidelines and for um, diagnosis, and we can't actually find an answer. And I will say, I agree with her. It's frustrating. And as a physician, it's yeah. frustrating for me to not give you the answers to your questions. Because again, going back to mental health, I really think that really affects their mental health, not knowing mm. what caused their situation and feeling yeah. like that it could happen at any time. And so yeah. something that I always try to do is give my patients as much clarity and reassurance as possible. But in cases like that, unfortunately, we just can't. And so in that standpoint, we just have to treat you the best that we can and watch you closely and go from there. Yeah. Yeah. And hopefully in the future, at some point, there might be, you know, an answer might come for her. But uh, yeah, it must be frustrating. Yeah. Um, Especially too, I think with modern medicine, you know, the biggest focus is we try to personalize things. And I think with genetic screening that, mm. you know, we're going to start doing more and more of, I think that's probably going to help us get a little bit more understanding in those cases where we just can't find a cause. I got uh, a question from Matthew Woods and he actually also appeared on the show here. So shout out to you, Matthew, if you're listening. And um, so uh, having had both a heart attack and three stents, then two months later, a sudden cardiac arrest, I continue to have angina variant, I believe, that is treated with extended release nitroglycerin. Any thoughts on mm -hmm. uh, possible underlying causes of angina? They say that the stents are clear and flow is open. And then he did also add, uh, this might be too de detailed or specific to answer for the podcast, so completely understand if it doesn't make the cut. Well, I did ask it for you, Matthew. So, uh, and I <laughs> added <laughs> this question to it, you know, what might be other reasons for angina? And maybe if you could also explain what angina is. So angina is just a fancy medical term for chest pain and chest pain from a cardiac standpoint. Um, there's kind of three factors that we look out for, for it to be what we call typical angina is usually it occurs with exercise, it gets better with rest or nitro. That's kind of something that um, criteria that we look at, but there's multiple reasons of why you can have that. I think in Matthew's um, um, mm -hmm. case, there's something that we have to think about called microvascular disease. So if you look at your heart arteries, you have three main arteries that feed the heart muscle, right? You have one that comes up on the right, and then you have one on the left called the left main that splits off into two other arteries. Yeah. And with most of the time when we put in stents, we're putting in stents in those major three arteries or kind of smaller arteries that come off of those major arteries. But if you think about it, it's almost like a network system. So you have a big artery that branches off and then those smaller arteries branch off and then those arteries branch off. And so even though the big arteries might be clear, you could have blockages in those kind of sidecars. So like for us in the United States, we, we have like highways and then you have like the service road, right? So the big arteries are like your highways and the smaller arteries are those service roads. So there may not be any traffic on the highway, but if you have a traffic jam on those side roads, that if you have multiple side roads that are blocked up, that itself can cause angina. And so things like isosorbide and long acting nitrates usually kind of help that. There's other medications that we can kind of give you to solve that as well. Um, but yeah, there's multiple different reasons of why you could have angina. One thing that we uh, typically see again is also called vasospasms. So there's like a muscular ring inside your artery, right? And it can clamp your arteries down and help them constrict. Sometimes medications, temperature changes, genetic predispositions can cause those arteries to spasm and clamp down. And so they kind of transiently block blood flow and that can mimic signs of a heart attack and cause chest pain as well. But then we go in and look, everything's completely wide open. So there's multiple reasons of why you can have angina. Um, but yeah, long acting nitros are going to be our biggest kind of mainstay of treatment and usually help to resolve that for sure. What about the, uh, uh, let's see if I can get this wrong, uh, right in English, uh, the gastrointestinal system? Because um, I actually recently, or like two months ago, they discovered that I had uh, a, a stomach ulcer, ulcer, I guess. So, ulcer? like, okay. 
Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, but I also was experiencing like a lot of chest pain. So could mm-hmm. it also be from from something like that for Matthew, for example? Oh, one hundred. So I wouldn't necessarily say that that was that's necessarily angina because we usually try to reserve angina for true cardiac type chest pain. But from a chest pain umbrella standpoint, oh yeah. So I tell patients if you really think about your chest, right, it's from here to the bottom, you know, from here. So yeah. there is a lot of stuff in your chest. There is your feeding tube, a portion of your stomach, your lungs, your heart, the lining that lines those different organs as well too. You have multiple lymph nodes and glands. So just because it's not your heart, it doesn't mean that something else is causing it. You can actually have referred pain as well too. So sometimes um, people can have things going on in their abdomen that's also causing kind of like referred pain up to the chest as well. And so everyone kind of gets really concerned about the heart, which I agree you probably should. So we try to roll out the most dangerous issues first. Once that's ruled out, once we know it's not your heart, once we know it's not the artery of your heart tearing or a large clot in your lungs, then we need to look at the non-cardiac causes of the chest pain. And so it's almost like a marathon race. We start off with the cardiologist. If my stuff is clear, then I pass the baton to the next um, physician mm. so they can finish up your evaluation and make sure yeah. nothing else is going on. Yeah, that happened a bit like <laughs> with me. Yeah, okay. Uh, so what would you recommend to Matthew? So I think definitely staying on long-term nitro would definitely help for sure. Making sure blood pressure is as low as possible because the higher your blood pressure is, the more workload your heart's going to have to do. So keeping your blood pressure and your heart rate under good control as well. Um, And then again, those lifestyle changes, keeping your cholesterol down, your blood sugar down, things of that nature. And then in particular, making sure you're seeing your doctor regularly so we can make sure that we're keeping up with your monitoring as well. Yeah. Okay. All right. Mm. Um, I'm going to throw one more question at you that I have. Uh, it's actually also one from Jane Carr, but it was one that I was kind of uh, curious about as well. So, um, so um, when I had my out of hospital sudden cardiac arrest, the notes in my medical file from the hospital said while I was in the ER, I would scream and kick my leg. I had a completely blocked right lower ventricle, had a silent STEMI. That threw me into VFib, short QT, uh, so you have sinus uh, tachycardia, and then sudden cardiac arrest. Do you think I was acting that way in the ER because I was still in fighting? I was still fighting for my life. My pulse was erect and weak, and I was not communicating or aware of anything. And uh, the reason why I'm also just curious about this is because when I hear my girlfriend talk about, and my mom as well, uh, when I was tight, well, when I was in uh, the hospital just after my cardiac arrest, uh, they had to tie me to the bed because I was in such a fight mode. Uh, and I'm just, uh, I made a little question to this. Um, is this common? Is this common that people enter like a fight mode during that moment? And why do our bodies decide to enter a fight mode then? I don't know. Is there anything? that we know about this or anything that comes to your mind, you know, uh, about this? Yeah. So our bodies are amazing and they're like pre-programmed to do certain things, especially mm. when we're under stress. But yeah, you hit the nail on the head. You know, there's something called a fight or flight response. And it's when your adrenaline system kind of kicks in. So you kind of have to imagine if you're going undergoing cardiac arrest, that means every organ in your in your body is not getting the oxygen that it needs. And so it's going to send out help signals like, hey, what is going on? So in that in that particular time frame, you're in you're definitely in survival mode. And so your body is just responding to the lack of oxygen, the lack of blood flow, and it's doing whatever it can to kind of keep you alive. So it's definitely common. Um, again, you're not going to get blood flow to the brain as well, too. So people can be what we call altered and not necessarily be in their right frame of mind. Um, Mm. And a lot of times they don't know what's going on. So we have some patients who will undergo cardiac arrest and they wake up with a tube in their mouth. So you can imagine how traumatic that is. If you, you know, were sleeping in your bed after a routine day, then to waking up in a hospital with restraints and a tube down, you're not going to know what's going on. So that's fairly Mm. common and it's fairly normal as well. Mm. I see. Makes sense. The other thing I was going to say, I'm sorry. No, it makes sense what you said. Go on. Yeah, but I, I just want to make another point because, you know, 
you you kind of said something she did as well too like a lot of these cardiac arrests happening outside the hospital most most cardiac arrests that are happening outside the hospital are happening at home and so yeah. it's really important you know i tell patients all the time it's really important to make sure that you and your loved ones and everyone around you they know cpr because that yeah. can be life-saving and so a lot of times people think that you know cardiac arrest is going to happen to someone that they don't know but if you look at the odds if it's outside the hospital, it's in your home. So that's a loved one. That's a close friend. That's someone that you like and love. And so you knowing CPR can be the difference between life and death, honestly. And so I always encourage everyone to make sure that they're up to date on CPR. Make sure your loved ones are up to date on CPR and so that everyone can make sure we're protecting each other. A hundred percent agree. This is also something with the Heart Warrior Project that I want to start doing, like to organize uh, some events here with the Red Cross to uh i don't know provide cpr training or or to just you know make an event around it uh mm -hmm. and i actually had someone on the podcast here brendan griffith who also had a cardiac arrest uh, and he said that you know it's crazy that we don't have ai aeds in apartments uh i know, you know with like like uh, the same with uh, what's the name in english when you have like a fire you can you know do it out. fire extinguisher yeah 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 why why do we not have that yeah aads uh, in apartments it 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 should really become a thing and i guess maybe maybe we might be working towards that right very slowly but it should become a thing i agree i mean it's funny because you know i i have i don't know if it's because I'm, I'm a physician but every time my wife and i are on vacation we always encounter some type of medical emergency. And so I kind of jump into doctor mode well, all yeah. the time. And so even if I'm in the airport, if I'm in a hotel, I always look if there's an AED around. And it's to the point now, I mean, I have like a bag in my car with like a stethoscope, a blood pressure machine. I'm this <laughs> close to just buying a defibrillator myself, just yeah. having it. Cause I agree. It's honestly, it should be universal and it should be everywhere. Yeah. Mm. Well, Dr. George Adeshino, thank you, I mean, so much for answering some of these questions. I actually just have um, two more questions, Not nothing, you know, that guests, uh, that, sorry, that guests, that listeners send it in, but that I just want to ask you that I'm curious about. Um, sure. You know, what is something that we as patients don't often realize that is quite a struggle or difficult for you as a cardiologist? around the work that you do because we as patients you know we have our complaints which are you know good complaints you know but i'm just also curious to actually throw the question at a cardiologist like what are things that we as patients aren't maybe aware around or aware of that is difficult for you that might help us to understand as well i think sometimes um i think people look at us as kind of like machines um, and that is humans. And yeah. so uh, it's funny because like, if I call in sick, sometimes people are like, well, doctors get sick. And I'm like, dude, I'm, <laughs> I'm human like you are. I, yeah. have, I have kids that are in school that get sick from school and then I get it. So I think yeah. it, they don't really humanize us. Yeah. I remember I took off. So I don't take off, uh, you know, I don't take a lot of vacation. I just, I just don't. I probably take more sick days than I take vacation. And I remember when my wife had our daughter, I took about two weeks off from work. And I remember a patient was like, why are you taking you know, all this time from work? Like you, mm. your wife had the baby, not you. And I was just like, not wow. really, they just really couldn't understand that I'm a person. And so- Not cool. It, and you know, and one thing with social media that I do like is it shows the other side of us and it shows people like, you know what? He is a human being just like me. He has a wife, he has kids. He's, yeah. I try to get to my kid um, swimming classes. I try to be there for them as a, as a father. And so I don't think people realize that standpoint and how difficult it is to juggle your responsibilities as a physician and mm. everything else. It, it's really tough and it's something that we all struggle with. And so I always tell people, give us a little grace, give us a little bit of patience. You know, we unfortunately live in a time where we want everything now, 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 and it makes it really difficult for us because I can't necessarily see 30 patients in the office and answer your phone call at the same time. I have to do things in a priority type of uh, a standpoint. So I try to personalize and, and humanize myself to my patients as much as possible. So as yeah. much as I'm asking them about their kids and their vacation, they're asking me as well too. And I really feel like that just helps with rapport and just helps us you know, yeah. connect as humans.
A lot. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for, for sharing that, actually. Yeah. And um, in your opinion, what aspects of patient care do you think cardiologists uh, or just the hospital, you know, as a whole could still greatly improve upon to help specifically cardiac arrest survivors? I think CPR. Um, I think CPR awareness and educating the public on what to expect. Um, I also, you know, I think, you know, we always kind of screen our athletes and our student athletes, yeah. but should we not be screening a little bit more or a little bit harder? And even for our athletes, we don't necessarily always do EKGs and other different tests. So should we be screening a little bit more for those patients? And so I think that's the biggest thing is we have to get the word out. We have to educate people more. We have to arm them with the tools and resources to combat it. And we 100% should be making sure that everyone knows CPR. Every That should be taught in schools, I think. It should be taught yeah. for everybody. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Yeah, CPR truly saves lives. I mean, you know, it's uh, an amazing life skill to just know. And I agree. Just like driving, you should know CPR. <laughs> it's uh, I like that. Know. <laughs> Get your license, learn CPR. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, well, again, thank you for being here on the show. Uh, like you said, you are also on social media. I don't know. Um, do you want to, yeah, if people want to follow you, uh, where where's the best place for people uh, to go to? Yeah, I'm, I'm mainly on Instagram. It's uh, at paging underscore dr dot a. So paging underscore doctor a. Um, I'm pretty heavily on there. I'm really big on making sure I'm educating and motivating people when it comes to cardiovascular conditions. So yeah, definitely give me a follow. Um, hopefully the content helps you. Yeah, I love it that you're on uh, Instagram actually and that you are through that way, through social media, sharing some more uh, well, showing the side that you're a human too, but also then, uh, yeah, educating people around the heart. It's, yeah, it's really, it's really appreciated actually. Uh, and for people listening in the show notes, I will link it up, uh, you know, the Instagram page so you can find it there. Dr. George Adesino, thank you for doing this. I really, really appreciated it. Anytime, man. And thank you for everything that you're doing. I think what you're doing is awesome. We need more people. We need more people like you to, to spearhead and to educate and to motivate and to see somebody that went through the same thing that they're going through and seeing how great you're doing. That's a great Testament. So I appreciate everything that you're doing as well. Oh, thank you. That's yeah, awesome. All right. And that concludes this episode with Dr. Adeshino. I hope that you gained something out of this episode and that your question got answered. Um, and if, well, it didn't, if I didn't ask your question, uh, then I hope at least that you still learned something out of this episode. Now, like I said in the intro in the beginning, um, if you want to ask your question to the next cardiac health expert, then be sure to subscribe to the newsletter as that's where I will, you know, make an announcement uh, who the next guest is or who the next cardiac health expert is, as well with uh, an intro who they are and where you can ask your question. Now, the newsletter is only intended for announcements, so I'm not gonna spam you like every day, week or month, um, but just only when there is an announcement like an upcoming health, cardiac health expert, or when there's a new episode or when we do an event. In the description, you can find a link to subscribe to the newsletter, or you can also, of course, just subscribe here to the podcast where I will also bring out that announcement. Uh, but if you also, of course, uh, want to uh, stay you know, up to date about any events that we do at the Heart Warrior Project, then definitely subscribe to the newsletter. Now, to find any of the resources mentioned by Dr. Adeshino, then be sure to check out the show notes, which are located in the description of this episode. Or if you can't find them that way, you can also go directly to heartwarriorproject.com slash podcast and search for George and it will pop up. All right, with that, maybe I get to welcome you again soon here on the podcast of the Heart Warrior Project. This is your host, Yelis Fass, signing off. Oh yeah, and if you want to support this project, uh, we got some really cool hoodies, very comfy hoodies. Uh, so if you're a survivor and you gained something out of this episode or out of the project and you want to help me continue doing this, then... I mean, it's not only comfy, 
Uh, it's... I, I don't know. I love wearing this pullover myself. I think the message on it to the world and to myself makes me feel very good and uh, more empowered. So I can recommend it. I wear it all the time. Uh, we have other stuff too. Right? We have like um, uh, a mug. And behind it is a, a great quote that, yeah... I uh, like to read every day again, so I use this mug all the time. In the description of this episode, you can also find uh, some more information and a link to get involved in the project. You can make a donation or you can buy some merchandise that we have. Again, in the description, you can find more info to get involved.